Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, this week saw the first plane load of children deported to Honduras since President Obama vowed to speed up the removal of more than 57,000 youths who fled to the United States from Central America in recent months. The group of 38 deportees included 21 children between the ages of 18 months and 15 years, along with 17 female family members. Among them was Victoria Cordova, who came to the United States with her nine-year-old daughter. They were captured at the U.S.-Mexico border after a 25-day journey and are now back in San Pedro Sula, the city with the highest murder rate in the world. Last month, children in Honduras were murdered at a rate of more than one per day. Cordova described her, her ordeal to reporters. I don't have any work. It's been four months without work. This is a part of what motivated me to go. The poverty, the situation here, this insecurity we live through. We see children nearby who are very young, 12 and 13 years old, and they drug themselves. It's terrible to live like this. Here we live a life where you can't even call the police because they are controlled by the gangs. When we crossed the river and they trapped us, we didn't think. We had some hope. And then when we arrived in McAllen, we were on the floor. There was dust. There were a lot of people there, and I was there for various hours. They call it an icebox because it's very cold there. We were there for two days. They took us to El Paso, Texas on a plane. And there in El Paso, Texas, we spent two days there sleeping on the ground, cold. On Tuesday, White House spokesman Josh Earnest said the experience of Cordova and others should demonstrate to Central Americans that, quote, they will not be welcome to this country with open arms. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, Honduran officials called for an increase in U.S. aid to Central America. Honduran Foreign Minister Mireya Aguero called for a, quote, mini Marshall Plan, similar to the U.S. anti-drug programs in Colombia and Mexico. In fact, U.S. funding and foreign policy has long shaped the lives of Central Americans. June 28th marked the fifth anniversary of the military coup that deposed the democratically elected Honduran President Manuel Zelaya, which the U.S. did not oppose. Our next guest argues it was the coup more than drug trafficking and gangs that opened the doors to the violence in Honduras and unleashed an ongoing wave of state-sponsored repression. We're joined right now by Dana Frank, professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, an expert on human rights in U.S policy in Honduras. She recently authored a piece titled, Who's Responsible for the Flight of Honduran Children? And in February, her article, The Thugocracy Next Door, appeared in Politico magazine. Dana Frank, welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, thank you for joining Excellent. us from the Stanford University studios. Um, explain why—what the background is for so many and so many children to be fleeing the violence in Honduras. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we keep hearing the fact that people are fleeing gangs and violence, but there hasn't been an analysis or discussion of why is there so much gang, gang activity and violence in Honduras. And the answer is this tremendous criminality that the 2009 military coup opened the door to when it overthrew the democratically elected president, Manuel Zelaya. The coup, of course, itself was a criminal act, and it really opened the door for this spectacular corruption of the police and up and down, top to bottom of the government. And that, in turn, means it's possible to kill anybody you want, practically, and nothing will happen to you. It's widely documented that the police are overwhelmingly corrupt. Even a government official charged with cleaning up the police uh, admitted last fall that 70 percent of the Honduran police are beyond saving. And you heard the woman, uh, uh, Ms. Cordova, say that, you know, the police themselves are tied in with organized crime and drug traffickers. Um, so when, when we talk about this violence, it's really important to understand there's almost no functioning criminal justice system and no political will at the top to do anything about this. The president and the new president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who came into power in January himself, um, was a major backer of the criminal coup when he was the president, was a key, uh, head of a key committee in the Honduran Congress at the time. And uh, a year and a half ago, as president of the Honduran Congress, Ill illegally overthrew part of the Supreme Court, and he illegally was part of uh, naming a new attorney general, loyal to him last summer, uh, named to an illegal five-year term. And he's built his campaign not around cleaning up the, 
the police, but a new military police that is expanding this militarization of Honduran society. And that military police itself is committing serious human rights abuses, in, including recently in May, beating up and jailing the most prominent advocate for children in Honduras. And, and Dana Franco, I remember being in San Pedro Sula back in the early 1990s. I mean, not only was the level of corruption incredibly high among the police forces, but there were the military was out in the streets constantly uh, patrolling. Uh, it's also one of the poorest countries uh, in all of the Americas. Uh, you've also referred to the impact of the uh, CAFTA uh, deal uh, on Honduras and on the, the, the poverty of the country. Oh, yeah, certainly it's not like there was ever a golden age in Honduras. But, you know, uh, as uh, Senator Tim Kaine said uh, in, a, in a hearing for the new ambassador to Honduras, that Hondurans are saying that the level of militarization as well, uh, he, he said the level of, of um, military repression and terror there is worse than it was in the early 1980s at the height of the U.S.-funded Contra War in Nicaragua that Honduras was the base for. So we, we need to talk about relatively this is even more terrifying than then, which is really saying a lot. Yeah, when we talk about um, the, the fleeing gangs and violence, it's also this tremendous poverty. And poverty doesn't just happen. It itself is a direct result of policies of both the Honduran government and the U.S. government, including privatizations, um, mass layoffs of government workers. Um, and a new, in Honduras, a new law that's now made permanent that breaks up full-time jobs and makes them part-time and ineligible for um, unionization, living, a living wage, and the National Health Service. And a lot of these economic privacies are driven by U.S.-funded lending organizations like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, which itself is funding the corrupt Honduran police. The Central American Free Trade Agreement is the other piece of this. Like NAFTA did for the U.S. and Mexico, it opens the door to um, this open competition between small producers in agriculture in Honduras, small manufacturers, and jobs are disappearing as a result of that. So we're, with this poverty that we're seeing that people are fleeing, it's not like people are like, let's go have the American dream. There are um, almost no jobs for young people. Their parents know it. And we're talking about starving to death. That's the alternative or being driven into gangs with tremendous sexual violence. And um, it's a very, very um, in, a tragic situation here, but it's not like a tragedy j just happened. It's a direct result of very conscious policies by the U.S. and Honduran governments. Professor Frank, I wanted to go to this issue of U.S. responsibility and turn to former Honduran President Manuel Zelaya, who was ousted five years ago. Um, we got a chance to sit down with him in 2011 at his home in Tegucigalpa. I had just flown in with him. This was after the coup, um, when a new president was chosen. And his family flew back uh, from Nicaragua to Honduras. Uh, it was the first time in uh, that he was at his home for several years. The U.S. State Department has always denied, and they continue to deny their any ties with the government, with the, with the coup d'etat. Nevertheless, all of the proof incriminate the U.S. government. Y todas los, las acciones que hace el gobierno de facto de, del golpista. And all of the actions that were taken by the de facto regime or the golpista regime, which are those who carried out the coup. Es para favorecer. And it is to, fa to, ma to put in, to, fa to make favor of. La política industrial. The, the industrial policies Militar. and the military policies and the financial policies of the United States in Honduras. That's former Honduran President Manuel Zelaya. Uh, Professor Dana Frank, he strongly felt that the U.S. was involved with the coup. What evidence is there for that? Well, the biggest evidence we have is that his plane stopped at the Air Force Base at Palmarola, uh, known as Sotocano Air Force Base now. Um, which is a joint U.S. and um, Honduran base. That plane could not have stopped there without U.S. permission. 
Um, we don't have the big smoking guns. We certainly have the behavior of the U.S. State Department and the White House after the coup, which was to legitimate the coup government as an equal partner to Zelaya, in fact, as a superior partner. They never denounced the, rep the, the spectacular repression after the coup. And they treated Zelaya like a bad child for trying to return to his home country. They, uh, they recognized, they announced that they would recognize the outcome of the illegitimate November elections after that, even before the votes were counted. And it was clearly they wanted the whole situation to go away. I mean, they clearly, Zelaya was in many ways the weakest domino of all the center left and left governments that had come to power in Latin America in the previous 15 years. And it was a message to all those other governments that we will back coups and we will overthrow you as well. Um, the U.S. then supported uh, President Lobo and the outcome of that uh, November 2009 election and uh, made up this fiction that it was a government of national reconciliation. And ever since has been uh, turning a blind eye for the most part to the spectacular human rights abuses, including killings by state security forces and really spectacular lack of political will to deal with corruption. Uh, at the very top of the government. Um, and the U.S. keeps acting like this is a, just a hunky-dory government that we should be working with as a partner. You know, I found it tremendously chilling um, to see, be reading newspaper reports, media reports of that plane load of children that came back to Honduras. And the U.S. working with the Honduran, Honduran government, welcoming those children with open arms when the, when the government itself is countenancing this problem. The government itself, you know, beat, uh, has uh, countenanced the beating up of the leading independent children's activists in, in the country. The government itself is, doesn't have the political will to clean up the police. So what does it mean that we're working with this partner to help these Honduran children. Well, we're also joined by Jennifer Harbury, a human rights activist and lawyer based in West Laco, Texas, near the U.S.-Mexico border. Her husband, Efraim Bamaca Velasquez, a Mayan guerrilla commander, disappeared after he was captured by the Guatemalan army in the 1980s. She's the author of Searching for Everardo, a story of love war in the CIA in Guatemala, and has spent decades pressing for declassified information on her husband's case. Well, welcome, Jennifer Harbury. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you. Talk to us about the, as we've been discussing Honduras, uh, many of the children are also c are coming from Guatemala. And again, some of that uh, history of U.S. Uh, involvement in Guatemala, especially in recent years. Yes, um, we've been horrified uh, by the thought of sending any of these children back since uh, by international and domestic law, they qualify as refugees, almost all of them. Um, I can certainly talk about the Guatemalan counterpart to what Dana was just discussing. Um, we talk sometimes about maybe the solution is to send more funding, uh, as she was saying, a new Marshall Plan to Central American countries. But that's, in fact, going to pour gasoline on the fire, especially in Guatemala, where a number of former and current top officials in the military are, in fact, the drug lords. Um, some of them have left the military, some are still in. Um, they got involved in the drug trade while the wars were going on, and they had airstrips that were valuable to the Colombian drug lords. Um, they um, became very wealthy that way and now have what are called parallel structures. And they organize, arm, and train the gangs themselves to do their dirty work. For example, the Zeta cartel that terrorized the border strip where I live now, which is almost down to Brownsville. I'm 10 miles from the Rio Grande. Um, the Zetas are one of the most feared cartels anywhere, totally brutal. They were armed, trained, and organized by the Guatemalan military special forces called the Caibiles, who, of course, in turn, were armed, trained, organized, etc., by the United States intelligence networks and trained many of them at the School of the Americas. Another example is Julio Roberto Alperez, a colonel, one of many high-level military officials, who is on the DEA corrupt officer list, but because he also worked as a paid CIA informant, no one has ever been able to go after him. So much like Honduras, we have one of the highest murder rates in the world. The femicide rate is something like 10 times higher than that in Juarez. As these refugees pour into the United States, we're taking all kinds of measures to justify sending them back and claiming they're not refugees. But the way we're doing that um, is, to, is to expedite 
or rush them through proceedings so quickly that they can't really tell their stories. And of course, they have no legal advice and basically turns on whether or not a 10 year old child when confronted with a border patrol agent or a young mother confronted with a border patrol agent is able and willing to say, I'm asking for political asylum. I'm in danger of persecution or abuse at the hands of the drug lords and the gangs. And all of those people know if they ever say those words, they're going to be dead when they go back home. It's the death penalty to squeal basically on the gangs or the drug lords in any way. So without a lawyer, within days, they're going to be headed home under expedited proceedings. So, and this is a violation of international law and also U.S. domestic law. If they qualify for asylum or treatment under the Convention Against Torture, if they're in danger of being harmed in this way, by people who either are government officials or who are, who are acting without um, the gov local governments being able or willing, quote unquote, to protect the population, then these people are refugees. They cannot be sent back. And sweeping them under the rug and getting them out of the country so fast that they can't tell their stories or get any legal advice is a double violation of humanitarian law. And it's something we're going to be answering for for a long time. Um, we're certainly not proud of having turned back the boatload of Jews to Nazi Germany, but at least we didn't sail out on the high seas, board the ships, and throw people overboard. These are children. These are refugees. We have to let them in. There are many kinds of uh, programs that we can um, put, into, put into action that would deal with the situation well in the same way we've done before. We could do deferred action, deferred enforcement, temporary protected status. We've done those things for Honduras and Haiti. Um, it would let people stay for a year or two and then have the danger in their homelands reconsidered. Um, meanwhile, they can work and support themselves. It would relieve the backup in the court. There's many alternatives. We're choosing to pretend that they're not refugees and send them home in violation of the law. We're going to have to leave it there, but we thank you both very much for being with us. We'll link to both of your work. Jennifer Harbour, human rights activist and lawyer, we're speaking to her right near the border in West Laco, Texas, near the Mexico border. Her husband, Efraim Bamaka Velasquez, a Mayan guerrilla commander, disappeared after he was captured by the Guatemalan army in the 1980s. He was tortured, he was murdered, and those involved with his killing uh, were uh, trained by the United States and specifically the Central Intelligence Agency. Dana Frank, we thank you for being with us uh, from Stanford University Studios, professor of history and university uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, expert on U.S. policy in Honduras. We'll link to your piece, who's responsible for the flight of Honduran children, as well as the other one, the thugocracy next door, which appeared in Politico magazine. This is.